Brooklyn real estate office in the 1970s. His goals point west, beyond the tough working class outer boroughs, and toward the glittering Manhattan skyline. I think where he grew up in Queens, Manhattan was across the East River. It was almost like Oz to him. So regardless of how much money his father had made in the outer boroughs of New York City, I don't think that meant anything to Donald unless you were successful in Manhattan. Not one to mince words. His father tells Donald that investing in Manhattan is a fool's bet. Beneath the glitter, the core of the Big Apple appears to be rotten. You go back to the late 70s. We were on our knees. We were looked upon as the welfare city, the crime capital. Between 1966 and 1973, the city's murder rate spikes 130%. But Donald sees past the tarnish and spots opportunity. He pushes back against his father's opposition, convincing him there are riches to be made in the battered borough. It actually was a great time to get into Manhattan real estate. Anyone who bought into Manhattan in the 70s made out well, because all you had to do was buy and hold. And Donald has access to his father's political connections, as well as his formidable fortune. He loaned me a tiny bit of money, and he thought I was nuts. But he said, you know what? I have such confidence in my boy. And I went to Manhattan and I made a fortune. What the fledgling mogul lacks in experience, he makes up for in swagger. Before long, Donald begins to make a name for himself. He used what his father gave him to make him uh, into this sort of cartoon version of a New York real estate mogul. And he's been playing that role ever since. In 1974, he makes his first big play in Manhattan securing an option to develop the Penn Central Railroad Yards on Manhattan's far west side. The railroad is bankrupt, and Donald has pledged to upgrade the dilapidated property. He pays nothing for the rights. Just the promise to build is enough for the politically connected developer to win approval. He came in and picked out high-profile projects, was very smart, and his true gift is self-promotion. Is it just money, or is it because you really are creative? Well, I don't know. I think it's, I hope it's, uh, to a large extent, the creativity, because the money, you know, ultimately it all doesn't matter for anybody. New York ultimately, cable television host yeah. Nikki Haskell first meets the young entrepreneur in 1975. I knew from the second that I saw Donald that he was a superstar. He caught my attention, and I knew that he was the real deal. He was smart. He was really smart and understood the real estate market. And he goes out into the world believing that he's the smartest guy and he's going to succeed. And that brings us back to Norman Vincent Peale and the power of positive thinking. In 1978, he lobbies the city to build a convention center on the site of the rail yards. Ultimately, it'll also prove, I feel, to be the most successful convention center in the world. But his intense confidence can also work against him. Before the city announces its official decision, Donald tells the press the deal is complete without consulting the city's bombastic mayor, Ed Koch, triggering a feud that lingers for years. It's the first of many high-profile political squabbles that will define their long relationship, as epitomized by this late 80s exchange on The Phil Donahue Show. You should not have called Mayor Koch a moron. That was not good public relations. <clears throat> Hey, what can I do? Well, doesn't it, isn't this, aren't you a little, don't you want to take this back I don't think it's bad public relations. Mm -hmm. No, I don't take it back. When it comes to running the city, he's about as bad as anybody I've seen. Ed Koch has been a disaster for New York. Uh, he's squealing like a uh, stuck pig uh, that uh, indicates to me that I'm doing the right thing. It was two of a kind. Sometimes you don't like in others what you, you know, have in yourself. And so they had these clashes, more because their personalities were so similar. They alienated each other in typically crazy fashion by just insulting each other in the press. And it's very emblematic of, of the double-edged nature of Donald Trump. The interesting question is why he feels the need to fight. He could have a lot more comfortable existence if he avoided most of the fights he gets into. On the Phil Donahue show in 1987, the host tries advising the Donald to show better restraint. This kind of language from someone of your power and influence is not good style. Phil, from my standpoint, it doesn't really matter. Again, I'm not running for office. Our country's going to hell. Trump's no-holds-barred approach to political debate is the cornerstone of his current campaign, much to the frustration of his opposition. What Donald Trump said is wrong. That is not how we win elections, and worse yet, that is not how you bring people together to solve problems. 
I think nothing is off limits with Trump. I mean, he even disparaged his rival Jeb Bush by saying he'd be sort of partial to Mexican immigrants because his wife is a Mexican. You know, he drags his wife into the campaign, which is off limits in normal politics. Because Bush said, my tone's not nice. My tone. I think Donald Trump probably doesn't mind coming off as a bully sometimes. Although Dr. Ludwig never treated Trump, she studied the roots of behavior like his among dominant personalities. Either it gets some new attention, gets some supporters, and gets a lot of people to be afraid to maybe attack him because they don't want to be attacked back. By 1976, Trump is well on his way to building his own fortune and a loud reputation as a New York celebrity. On a night out, he meets a woman whose drive rivals his, Ivana Zelnikova, a competitive skier from Czechoslovakia. She was beautiful. She's got a great sense of humor. She's quite fun to be with. She's a smart woman. She's well-read. The two of them made a nice, interesting pair. He was also, though, the same fella who, two weeks before the wedding, would say, by the way, here's the prenuptial agreement. Please sign. Now, that became a kind of difficult negotiation, but she did sign. In 1977, the couple married at Reverend Norman Vincent Peale's Marble Collegiate Church. With Ivana's charm offsetting Donald's brash personality, the pair appears suited for the New York social scene and the late 70s nightlife it embodies. There's only one problem. Donald and Ivana were very square when they first got married. They very rarely went out. They were not partiers. In 1977, their friend Nikki drags the Trumps out to what would become the biggest party event of the year, the grand opening of Studio 54. But they insist on dropping by right after an early dinner. I mean, I didn't want to say to him, it's a little early to go to a discotheque, but it was. So we get to Studio 54, and there's no one there. Donald and Ivana head home before the celebration even starts, completely missing out on the wild night that follows. Donald, who doesn't smoke, drink, or take drugs, might not be built for 1970s New York nightlife, but he is built for 1980s Republican politics. In 1980, he vigorously supports Ronald Reagan's presidential campaign. He's thinking to himself, well, if Ronald Reagan can be president, I can certainly be president. The future reality star watches the former actor exciting supporters with the slogan, Make America Great Again. We'll welcome them into a great national crusade to make America great again. A lesson he'll never forget. I have some of the greatest assets in the world. Best locations in Manhattan. Trump Tower, 57th and 5th. That's what I do. That whole, whatever it is, whatever kind of a brain that is, will be used to making our country rich again. Donald Trump has never lacked confidence. And in the 1970s, he takes over his father Fred's lucrative real estate business. Outthinking and outmuscling potential competitors and bragging about it. Here's a guy who was a real estate developer who, who seemed to require media attention like you and I need air and water. That's what makes Donald Trump Donald Trump. The fact that he likes himself, that he has this grand image of himself, really helps him to accomplish things that other people can't accomplish. By the time he's 30, Donald has eclipsed his father as the embodiment of the Trump real estate empire. Fred was kind of afraid of Manhattan, and Donald was all about Manhattan. But Donald doesn't just look at Manhattan as a place to turn a profit. He's out to brand the city his own way and make Manhattan great again. Donald Trump built this whole idea of these luxury condos before anybody did. In 1976, he launches into a project to transform the rundown Commodore Hotel next to Grand Central Station into a symbol of a revived New York. Lots of people looked at it, but it was Donald Trump who got the...